Robert Mardini is the Director General of the International Committee of the Red Cross, and he joins me now. Mr. Mardini, it's nice to meet you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. I'd like to start with an update on the hostage situation, if I could, as your organization is playing a role in those negotiations. President Biden has repeated a call for a humanitarian pause to help get hostages out of Gaza. Do you have any sense as whether a humanitarian pause would be helpful in the negotiations to release people? Absolutely. Uh, by any means, a humanitarian pause first will provide respite uh, for the civilian population. Civilians in the Gaza Strip today uh, are caught between a rock and a hard place. Uh, uh, they are uh, really running out of options when it comes to getting uh, access to basic services. So a humanitarian pause makes sense first for the people, second for the humanitarians, such as uh, my colleagues on the ground, the volunteers of the Palestine Red Crescent Society who need uh, some poses in order to be able to carry out life-saving operations on the ground, supporting hospitals, uh, providing surgical equipment uh, uh, to hospitals, uh, working hand-in-hand uh, -in -hand with the Palestinian surgeons and nurses uh, to save lives, and of course providing uh, basic uh, support to water uh, supply schemes uh, in order to ensure uh, uh, a fluid uh, supply of drinking water to the but, population. But on the negotiations to release the hostages themselves, I've seen some reports that you know Hamas officials suggesting if there was some sort of a ceasefire or a temporary stop, it might facilitate the release of, say, women and children or, or foreign nationals uh, who are being held hostage. Do you have any sense of whether that could actually improve the hostage release conversations? It could certainly facilitate, uh, but let me be uh, clear and upfront, uh, and we have been extremely clear about it, uh, uh, hostages should be released unconditionally, mm -hmm. uh, especially the civilian ones, uh, because uh, this is what uh, uh, is expected under international humanitarian law. Uh, our, our colleagues uh, uh, have been uh, very clear from the beginning, uh, offering uh, services to visit uh, hostages, to check on their health, uh, to provide medicines if they need so, or to provide uh, the possibility to exchange messages uh, between hostages and their families. Mm -hmm. And of course, our colleagues uh, has stood ready uh, since the beginning to facilitate any, um, any uh, release of uh, hostages, provided there is a negotiated agreement by the parties uh, to do this. We, we've seen reports, though, there was a, there was a uh, back to back days, uh, an Israeli strike at the Jabalia refugee camp. Hamas is claiming that this killed seven of the hostages. Do we have any way of knowing how many hostages are alive, how many hostages are dead, or what condition they're in? I, I know you haven't been able to see them, but do you have any hard information on their status? Well, we, we, we didn't have the possibility to visit, so we don't have any uh, information about that. Uh, we uh, are in conversations with Hamas, uh, pressing uh, them, of course, to uh, take every precaution and treating uh, hostages uh, in humane conditions, uh, hoping also that we will be able to visit to, uh, to check ourselves on their health. Uh, and, uh, and also facilitate any, any exchange. But let me maybe uh, say a few words, because you mentioned Al Jabaliya uh, mm -hmm. camp, and this is uh, one of the largest refugee camps uh, uh, where people are, uh, have been living in desperate conditions even before this uh, round of escalation started. And of course, uh, uh, the images we've seen uh, from Jabaliya camp uh, uh, are distressing, uh, seeing wounded children being extracted from uh, under the rubble is beyond heartbreaking, as is in certainly uh, intolerable uh, for any humanitarian organization uh, um, uh, to see that. Uh, uh, and this uh, is really why uh, the rules of war, the Geneva Conventions, international humanitarian law should be respected by all parties to this conflict uh, to alleviate the suffering and to reduce uh, the suffering caused by this uh, conflict. I, I think it's pretty clear none of that was respected on October 7th with the way Hamas conducted the, the slaughter of, of Israeli civilians uh, in the kibbutzes and various, various towns in, in Israel. What is your assessment of how Israel is conducting its offensive on Gaza? We've had a lot of aid groups on the show that say the shelling amounts to indiscriminate fire, which they say could be a war crime. The siege, they say, is collective punishment, which they say could amount to a war crime. And the denial of fuel and water and these things, people argue, is a war crime. 
the ICRC or the keeper uh, of the Geneva Conventions. How do you assess what's happening there? Well, for us, and the ICRC has been very clear and unambiguous about uh, the event, the tragic event of the 7th of October. And for us, uh, every loss of civilian life is one too many and uh, should be uh, avoided in armed conflict. Uh, um, uh, and this is why uh, we are uh, repeatedly uh, calling and uh, reminding parties to the conflict of their obligations under international humanitarian law, that uh, uh, they have the obligation to take every precautions, every feasible measure to protect civilians, to prevent uh, further uh, loss of civilian lives, and uh, uh, to ensure that there is a distinction when military operations are carried out between military targets and civilians and civilian in infrastructure, uh, and that sky is not the limit when, when it comes to using force in armed conflict. And this is the principle of proportionality. But, but do you believe that principle of proportionality is being applied and followed here? Israel says uh, it, it takes precaution to minimize uh, the d civilian deaths, but then it also says Hamas uses civilians as human shields and embeds its military commanders inside civilian operations like the refugee camp, which they used to justify the strike the other day. I mean, do you think proportionality is being applied here? Well, I will not reveal any uh, of the content of our confidential dialogue with parties to the conflict, but it is clear that uh, international humanitarian law uh, prohibits the use of uh, civilians as human shield, uh, mm -hmm. prohibits the use of civilian infrastructure uh, in conducting uh, military uh, operations. This is absolutely clear. Uh, so whatever uh, we are able to uh, see firsthand, we will raise bilaterally and confidentially with parties to the conflict to ensure that uh, uh, they take, they try harder to protect civilians. I mean, today when we look at the human cost uh, of this conflict, uh, uh, it, uh, it is not acceptable. It's simply not good enough. And parties to the conflict must, uh, must try harder uh, to, preverse, to preserve a space for humanity in war. There's one issue I, I wanted to touch on uh, before we let you go, and this is the Al-Shifa Hospital in, in northern Gaza, the largest hospital inside the area, and one that the IDF has told uh, the Palestinians to evacuate, get out of there. And doctors we've had on the show repeatedly say, there's people on ventilators we can't move, there are people, in, there are babies in incubators we can't move. The Jabalia attacks have sent more people there. We sp had a spokesperson for the IDF on the show who said, we've given them weeks of notice. That is enough time for them to move the people. I know it would be her, but you can do it. They also, last week, Israel released what they consider an intelligence assessment saying Hamas is using this hospital as a command and control center. Does that justify making al-Shifa a military target? Because it seems as though Israel is building a case for this, or at least laying out the possibility for it. Well, hospitals are sanctuaries uh, that should be protected uh, at all times in armed conflict. Uh, no uh, patient, uh, no injured person, no baby, uh, no elderly person uh, taking uh, medical care in hospitals should die in a hospital bed. No doctor, no nurse uh, should be killed in the line of duty. This is absolutely uh, clear. Uh, at the same time, it is prohibited to use hospitals as uh, areas to launch uh, attacks. Right. This is also extremely uh, clear. The problem in this case, uh, in Shifa and other hospitals in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip, is first, indeed, you cannot unplug um, uh, an incubator having an infant in it or uh, the oxygen uh, from an elderly getting uh, oxygen or, uh, you know, people from ICU that who are severely injured because they will die. So this is this is unacceptable. Uh, but uh, then today there are no Plan B. There is no hospital on standby right. uh, in the Gaza Strip, even to transfer uh, in a swift way any patients uh, from this hospital to another hospital. So. Uh, there are no other options. So uh, Al-Shifa Hospital and other hospitals are sanctuaries that should be protected. So how do we reconcile that, uh, just as a final point? If Israel is saying Hamas is in there, it's command and control, there's tunnels underneath it, just like there were in the Jabalia refugee camp. But the situation with the patients is, as you say, right? It is overcrowded and there's no options. How do we reconcile that under the laws of war and humanitarian law and just basic humanity in terms of what could happen with a place like Al-Shifa? Well, basic humanity should always advocate 
to save lives in the worst of circumstances. So as a humanitarian, I can only tell you that mm -hmm. pending viable alternatives uh, that can ensure that no life is lost, uh, this hospital should stay and should be protected and should remain a sanctuary. That's my position. Do you think we'll see the humanitarian pauses or the ceasefire that the aid groups are, are looking for, given the political context in Israel and sort of the ferocity of the attack we're seeing right now? Or do you think you have to make the best you can with the situation as it is? I mean, humanitarian pauses or not, parties to the conflict are bound uh, by respecting the rules of four. This is one. Mm -hmm. Second, I'm an optimistic person and I hope that there will be humanitarian pauses because humanitarian pauses will allow us to save more lives and to carry out uh, our work uh, for the Palestine Red Crescent to also uh, do their work. So we, we will continue to advocate for regular, realistic humanitarian pauses uh, that are in the best interest of everyone because some space for humanity should prevail uh, even in the darkest moments of humanity. Robert Mardini, the Director General of the International Committee of the Red Cross, thanks for your time today. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.